Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's Black History Series presentation titled The Black Londoners Project, Creating a Digital Archive. Our guest speakers today are Dr. Alyssa McLean and Dr. Marinda Green-Bartit. Alyssa McLean is an assistant professor at Western University in the Department of English and Writing Studies. Her scholarly work focuses on the literary relationship between Canada and the United States prior to the U.S. Civil War. Along with Marinda Green-Bartit, she is a co-investigator of the Black Londoners Digital Archive, which has just received funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Marinda Green Bartit is an associate professor at Western University, cross appointed in the English and Writing Studies Department and the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Department. Her research areas are 19th century U.S. literature and contemporary young adult literature. All of her research focuses on the ways in which marginalized individuals challenge systems of oppression and empower themselves. She has published on Harriet Jacobs, Harriet Wilson, Sarah Pogson, Elizabeth Stewart Phelps, and Laura Ingalls Wilder, as well as young adult dystopian fiction and young adult speculative fiction. Her most recent edited collection, Race in Young Adult Speculative Fiction, was awarded the Best Edited Book Award in 2023 by the Children's Literature Association. The Black Londoners Project is also a project with many research assistants who have helped lay the groundwork for this presentation, including Lizzie hines Huglin, Patrick Kingham, and David Mitterer, who are all present on our team's call today. So thank you for joining us as well. Uh, before we begin, I uh, would ask that our before our, while our speakers are presenting, if you could please mute your microphone so that it doesn't distract our speakers, that would be very helpful. Uh, also, following the presentation, there will be a question and answer period, so just type in your comments in the or questions in the comment section, or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you at that point. And at this point, you're welcome to turn your microphone on, microphone on again as well. Uh, one final note, if you would like to support programming such as our Black History series, you can donate by going to our website, amosburgfreedom.org. Now I'm going to pass it over to our guest speakers. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I yes. can. Yep. Great. Sounds awesome. great. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine, for that lovely introduction. Uh, as Lorreen said, I'm Marinda Greenberti, and I really want to thank the Amherstburg Museum and Maureen specifically for this invitation to speak with you all today about the Black Londoners Project. So um, my portion of the presentation is going to be focused on background and sort of how we got to the project. And then Alyssa is going to take over and talk more about where we are and uh, give us an overview of one of our case studies. Uh, so for a bit of background, I am an American, although I am a Canadian citizen now. And I grew up in the South, in Charleston, South Carolina, to be precise. Growing up in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, I learned a lot about that particular city's history including its part in the Civil War. Charleston is the city where the first shots of the war were fired. But I didn't learn a lot about Black history until I took a course in African-American literature when I was uh, in my third year attending the College of Charleston. And in that course, I learned a bit about the history of the city's Black residents and the ways in which enslaved individuals were treated. I also learned about the ways that Jim Crow laws were enforced and about the protests for civil rights in the city. In fact, one of the college's buildings used to be a department store with a segregated lunch counter. In 1995, I took a French class in the same space where young African-American men and women were forcibly removed from the Crest department store lunch counter in the 1960s. The things I learned about Charleston, specifically in African-American literature in general, were a large part of the reason why I focused on African-American women writers in my graduate work. Uh, could you change the slide, Alyssa? Thank you. Um, in 2008, I moved to London, a city that I knew nothing about. Uh, in the 15 years that I've lived in London and that I've taught at Western, I have learned a fair amount about this particular city. I visited Eldon House, the Fanshawe Pioneer Village, the Museum of Archaeology, and the Banting Memorial. I've taken walking tours of downtown, and I've learned quite a bit about the history of Western. But I have learned, or prior to starting this project, I had learned very little about London's Black history. When I visited Eldon House with my children, I asked the guides if there were any Black residents of the city in the 19th century. The guide told me that the city was a stop on the Underground Railroad, but didn't know much else. Admittedly, at that time, uh, with a full teaching and research load and three young children, I didn't have much time to do independent research on the project. Fast forward to 2016, and the English and Writing Studies Department uh, hires Alyssa hired Alyssa McLean. I quickly learned that Alyssa and I have overlapping research interests. 
and coincidentally live on the same street in London. Uh, where my work in the 19th century is firmly rooted in U.S. authors, primarily women, Alyssa's work focused on the representation of the U.S. and Canada border, specifically the ways that U.S. and Canadian authors represented border crossings. Over many co uh, conversations and as many cups of coffee, we began thinking about ways to collaborate. We were and continue to be very interested in the ways that Canada is positioned in direct opposition to the U.S. Ter to the US, especially in terms of racial politics. In literature, film, television, and the general cultural imagination of North Americans, Canada is considered a safe and welcoming place, whereas the US is a place that's dangerous and unwelcoming for people of color. At that time, I was working on an essay on the representation of race and the television adaptation of Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, and I uh, wanted Alyssa's input. As a result of that particular conversation, we wrote an article examining how the series, and to a lesser extent Atwood's novel, represents Canada as a, as a place of safety, as a racial haven, almost a racial utopia, overlooking Canada's history of colonization, enslavement, de facto segregation, residential schools, and treatment of immigrants. Once that article was published, we knew we wanted to continue to explore representations of Blackness and Canadian in U.S. literature, but we weren't sure how. Having completed a project on contemporary literature, I wanted to return to the 19th century. And uh, during a March break play date with that we had arranged for our children, we started talking about applying for a grant to explore archi archival documents related to Black Canadians. Can, there we go. Um, Alyssa asked me if I'd ever read Benjamin Drew's The Refugee or a North Side View of Slavery. I told her that I had, but that it had been years. She reminded me that the book contained a chapter on London. And after a few searches and some further conversations, we realized that very little was known about, um, about the 16 Black Londoners detailed in Drew's book. We began thinking about what that absence meant. What had happened to those individuals after Drew's narrative was published in 1856? Did they stay in London? Did they return to the States after the Civil War as so many formerly enslaved individuals who had fled to Canada did? As our list of questions about these individuals and the history of 19th century London's Black residents grew, the Black Londoners Project was born. Um, and you'll notice that we're showing an image of Drew on this particular slide. Sharing an image of him is something that we debated uh, and something that we continue to debate, to debate as a research team uh, because we really don't want to privilege him over the Black individuals that we're researching. But the reality is we have an image of Drew and we have yet to locate any images of the 16 Black Londoners of which this pro on which this project focuses. And the fact that we have an image of Drew and not an image of any of the Black Londoners that we're gonna to talk to you about today speaks directly to the gaps and the absences that we're trying to address. So with the Black Londoners, we are trying to recover the histories of Black individuals who left the US and settled in London, Ontario in the mid 19th century. Specifically, we are researching and documenting the lives of 16 freedom seekers whose biographies were recorded by Drew in his 1856 book, The Refugee. We know that from 1854 to 1855, Drew interviewed these 16 Black Londoners. His transcriptions of their narratives describe their experiences escaping slavery and settling in London. Some individuals like Alfred T. Jones, whom Alyssa is gonna talk a little bit more about later, and Alexander Hamilton represent their lives in positive terms, describing their work history and successful businesses. Others, such as Frances Henderson and Henry Moorhead, detailed, detailed the segregation and discrimination they faced in London. While the biographies give readers a glimpse into these individuals' lives, as I have said, we know little about them beyond what Drew recorded. The Black Londoners Project collects more information about these 16 individuals and prevent, presents this information via an open access website that links individuals' narratives with interactive maps, sound recordings, photographs, and other archival sources. By collecting these sources together, we hope to share the stories of these 16 individuals, their community, and their London. 
the project's interactive maps will show where Black Londoners lived and worked, where their schools and churches were located, and we hope what parts of the U.S. they fled. Uh, we are also currently working on a map that will show the global connections, as it were, that these individuals had. So, so the, the, the relationships that they had with other people who traveled beyond Canada and the United States. We are not the first to do research on these 16 freedom seekers, and we want to acknowledge the work of others. Our project will use some of the historical findings and strategies employed by Western public history professor Michelle Hamilton's Hear Hear London project, including voice actors and local Black community leaders to narrate sections of the 16 narratives of our study. Uh, we also want to acknowledge the, the work of public organizations like the London Black History Coordinating Committee. So our project addresses five research questions. Who were the 16 Black Londoners represented in Drew's book? What happened to them after Drew's book was published and the emancipation of US slaves? How accurate, accurately did Drew depict their lives, especially their experiences in London? Did they have connections to other Ontario communities and did they maintain connections to family and friends in the United States? What do their stories teach us about life for Black people in 19th century London? Through archival documents, census data, and city records, uh, we hope to determine where they lived, where they worked, what churches or schools they or their children attended, what US state they fled, and where they lived after their encounter with Drew. Our goal is to gain a better understanding of what their lives in London were like. And in so doing, this project aims to complicate our understanding of Black life in Canada in the 19th century. The narratives that form the core of our materials were written during a period of historical and political turmoil. Drew wrote The Refugee in direct response to a book called A South Side View of Slavery which was written in 1854 by Reverend Nehemiah Adams of Boston. A pro-slavery advocate, Adams contended that African-Americans were happy, were quote, happy to be slaves, end quote, and that enslavers were protecting and educating black people, a very common 19th century justification for enslavement. Drew responded to Adams' claims by traveling to Canada and interviewing formerly enslaved people who had settled there. Uh, in 1856, as I'd already said, said, he published The Refugee with the publishers, with using the same publishers who had published Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. In The Refugee, Drew represented a diverse group. Some of the 16 Black Londoners were successful, others were poor. They were variously employed, and some hoped re to return to the U.S. if slavery were abolished, while others planned to stay in Canada. In most cases, Drew offers a detailed account of their lives, but little about them is known beyond what he recorded. Further, there are few written accounts of Black Londoners from 1856 uh, until the dawn of tomorrow, which was London's first Black newspaper, began circulating in 1923. This lack of textual evidence creates a gap in our historical knowledge of Black life in London. With this context in mind, this project aims to complete archival work on these 16 individuals to expand our knowledge of, of them specifically, of London in the 19th century, and to understand how Black individuals, whether traveling through or settling in London, experienced the city. Uh, our research team, which includes uh, two graduate students and a research associate, all of who are here today, as Alyssa has already said, recognizes that we have a lot to learn. And as I have said, many have already done work in this area. Uh, and much of that work has been completed by local historians and community groups. And as we complete our work, we want to draw on and most importantly, acknowledge their work. Therefore, this project brings together academics, community groups, local historians, and students to recover, understand, and document 19th century Black life in London, and to share findings widely beyond the academic community. Um, as I said, a lot of this information already exists, but is often held within the walls of the academy and it hasn't made its way to the general public. And we would like to make sure that it does make its way to the general public. Um, 
the efforts to examine London's Black history, both in community and scholarly contexts, has not gained the public recognition or permanence that we see in other centers of Black life, such as Chatham, Ontario, for example. And one reason for that may be that except for the AME Chapel, which is sometimes referred to as the Fugitive Slave Chapel in London local history and in Black communities, which was recently moved to Fanshawe Pioneer Village, so London lacks significant architectural sites with which to celebrate and commemorate Black history. Historic sites and museums such as Museum London have provided brief analyses of London's 19th century Black community, but references to Black life in London are relatively sparse. And our project is trying to address this heritage gap by centering the stories of Drew's Black interviewees, examining the intricacies of their community relationships, and um, uncovering archival research. We're also trying to represent their labor through revealing tax records and census information, um, neither of which are terribly interesting to actually look at, but the information that they reveal is fascinating. We're also looking to present visual evidence of past locations of Black life alongside the erasures that have happened since. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Alyssa, who is uh, going to talk more specifically about one of our case studies. Great. Uh, thank you, Marinda. Um, so my name is Alyssa McLean, and I want to echo Marinda in thanking um, Lorene for the invitation to come speak to you today. Uh, we're both very excited to be here virtually and very pleased to be able to discuss this. Um, as Marinda explained, my main research area is in Canada-US border studies in the 19th century, and I researched the literature um, that 19th century American writers wrote about Canada. And many of those stories consisted of slave narratives written by formerly enslaved African Americans who made their way to Canada. As researchers and teachers, we're trying to actively acknowledge the ways that research projects navigate power relations, especially historic power imbalances, and how researchers can be more self-conscious about these power relations as they design and conduct their research. So before we get started and talking about an actual case study, I wanted you to think about some questions. So here are the questions that, that we've kind of uh, formulated. Um, the first one, when I visualize mainstream Canadian history, do early Black presences come to mind? Did I learn about Black Canadian history throughout any educational experiences, like in post-secondary schooling or in uh, local history organizations? And if so, did the histories acknowledge the complexities of early Black Canada? And I think all of these questions are unified by an interest in, in our interest in how, how people learn about Black history in Canada and what sources build that history that people do know. Um, one issue that our research project has already confronted is the fact that 19th century power, racial power structures have affected the nature of the records that have been preserved and the quantity of records that we can find. For example, we have to recognize that the text and the photograph that we showed you of Benjamin Drew has been physically preserved, while 19th century Black Canadian literature and their textual records often have not. And we're somewhat limited to and by what Benjamin Drew thought of Black Londoners, how he represented their experience. So Drew's lens is ultimately going to shape our view. Did he edit testimonies? We don't really know. Were there omissions? Who introduced him to the to the people in the community? You know, did he transcribe the oral histories accurately? We can even extend our analysis of Drew to ourselves as researchers. When we're engaging with Black London history and the Black London community, we approach our research with an awareness of our positions that we're not really taking ownership of Black London's history, but we're participating in bridging the gap between Black history and public memory. This problem of Black absence extends beyond literary preservations. We see these absences in tangible documentation, in built architecture, in 19th century photography, in burial locations. Um, so, for example, in our research, we're having difficulty locating places that where Black Londoners lived or worked in photographs. They just never seem to have been the primary subject of a 19th century photograph when other London locations by contrast, are photographed a lot. 
So um, is this a question of what buildings were considered worthy of being photographed in the 19th century? Or is it also a question of what has been chosen to be preserved by archivists, right? Um, so all of these elements come into play when we're building our own archive. Um, we also recognize that these absences challenge our definition of, le of legitimacy. Oftentimes what is archived is considered legitimate evidence. And in the case of black absences, researchers may need to question what legitimate means and use interdisciplinary approaches such as searching outside the archive, engaging with oral histories, um, looking into personal materials that were carried down by black community descendants. Um, so we really need to be aware of our own lenses as researchers and our own limitations. How are we interpreting these materials? Does our positionality or our preferred theoretical or conceptual lens, like a feminist lens or a print cultural lens, come into play? And how do these lenses shape our analysis? So today we'd like to go through the example of Alfred T. Jones. Alfred T. Jones was a Black Londoner who probably has the most documented paper trail in our collection so far. And this is very much a work in progress, but we want to give an example of how our website will try to represent past spaces and what kinds of materials we have to work with. OK, so um, this is uh, this. We'll start with Alfred T. Jones. So this is um, Alfred T. Jones's um, a narrative in Benjamin Drew. Um, so in his narrative, he talks about uh, keeping an apothecary shop on Rideout Street. That's a main street in London. Um, he talks about where he came from. He talks about how he entered the country. Um, he talks a little bit about um, the uh, racial interactions he's had in London. Um, to give you some backstory here, um, Alfred Thomas Jones, um, came to Canada with his brother, uh, who was Abel Bedford Jones, A.B. Jones, and together they were some of the most prominent Black Londoners in the 19, in the, sorry, 1850s. Um, Alfred Jones was important in the religious community. He was also important in the physical, you know, uh, landscape of London. He uh, was started out as a barber and he became a pharmacist and then uh, advertised himself as a doctor later in life. Um, and the fact that we have tax records means that it's easier to pinpoint his pharmacy slash doctor's office um, in downtown London, whereas other figures are somewhat more difficult, right? Um, one added complication in our research is that the 1850 census is missing for London. <laughs> So we've had uh, many opportunities to uh, wish that that were otherwise, but this is the reality of the situation. In any case, um, Alfred Jones was from Madison County, Kentucky, and uh, he made his way to London in, uh, uh, in the early uh, 19th century. Um, so we noticed that he has an, this apothecary shop on Rideout Street, which is something to go on. And so we started looking into what we can find about him. Um, so, um, so this is where he talks about where he belongs and St. Catharines. Um, this is what we found so far. So um, these are census records. Uh, and now census records are not that fun to look at, but this is often the best kind of materials that we have. Uh, for historical documents, and especially for black folks in the public record. So you can see here A.T. Jones is here and his family. Um, they, there was a uh, list of people who lived in his household. There was a white woman who lived with his family, maybe some sort of tenant. Uh, we're not really sure what her connection was. They're listed as black. Um, when you can see there's like racial uh, designators here. Um, they're uh, listed as Baptists. He's listed as a druggist. So here it says here his, um, I hope you can see my cursor. Here you can see uh, his occupation. Um, and he and his wife, Anne, are born in the US and had children in Canada. So that all tracks with what we know from his narrative. Um, and then we went to the tax assessment rules. So um, this shows that A.T. Jones rents space from a Reverend Bailey on North Dundas West. So this is a lot number, not a street address. Um, they didn't have street addresses at that point in London's history. Um, and then, so this is as best we could. This is what we think of 
uh, was his location. So the blue, um, the blue uh, square here is his location. Um, and um, it was at the intersection of Dundas Street and Rideout Street. And so the up, like the topmost part of this is north. Um, and across the street from A.T. Jones was A.B. Jones's store. So A.B. Jones had a dry, a dry goods store. Um, and so one of the things we're interested in is the fact that they were basically across the street from each other in the middle of downtown London. Um, so this tells us something about how he would have moved through the downtown and also tells us something about the visibility of London's black population that that, you know, people s would recognize these two figures um, across the street from each other on the, you know, London sidewalk right beside the courthouse. So this was like a major street in London and also a very visible high visibility location for them to um, exist in. So do we have photos? What did the space really look like? The, uh, you know, we have a lot of photos of the courthouse. So this is London's courthouse, um, the historic courthouse. Um, and so, and so you can see this kind of castle like structure here. And you can also see there's an arrow here that I've put in, which is Rideout Street going north. Um, and the uh, location of the uh, building that we really want to see is just outside the frame on the top of this corner. Um, so uh, you can see that the courthouse was, this was an 1830s aerial shot. Um, we have lots of photos of the courthouse and many taken from basically what would have been in front of Jones's apothecary, but none of them actually show his store. Um, they're always kind of outside the frame. So I'll give you another example. Here's the courthouse, this castle-like structure on the left and some other buildings. And then his store would have been just outside the frame on the right side, um, on the other side of Rideau Street. So Rideau Street is the purple arrow, and on the other side of Rideau Street, there would be um, his location. Um, it would be this corner here in the new map of London. Um, and then, so this is another example of what it looks like now. Um, and this is Rideau Street right here. And you can see there's lots of change happening in downtown London. This big uh, building is sort of where his, his building would have been. Um, so, and this is the location. And this blue square would be where his uh, shop would have been and the green square is where A.B. Jones's shop would have been. So I'm kind of giving you a better close up here. So the north side of the street is where A.T. Jones's shop would have been and the south side of the street is where A.B. Jones's shop would have been. And you'll notice that they've been replaced, right? We don't see Jones's shop. Instead, what we see is erasure. So this mapping um, is going to help us understand the structure of the black community and London's history. Um, you know, I think that uh, what's ironic here is that both of these locations, the new kind of improved buildings that have been built on the locations where the black community, these two members of the black community were, um, are all ironic in their own way. So the north side is the Ontario Court of Justice which is named after Richard Pierpo Pierpoint, um, who was a black loyalist that didn't live in London. So the actual black community in London has been erased um, to be replaced by this building. And then the south side of the street uh, is where Budweiser Gardens is. So this is a hockey arena. Um, and the irony is that the outside of this building's facade has all of this kind of this uh, reproduced 19th century facade. So it's trying to fit in with the landscape, but it's erasing the actual history of um, London's black experience, right? Um, so that can sometimes feel a bit frustrating for us, I think. Um, and we have found some images. So this is, these are the images we do have. Um, so here is, uh, these are both illustrations, or these are from a map, uh, an illustrated map. And um, we think that this building here is where A.T. Jones's shop would have been and A.B. Jones's shop is on the other side. The problem is that illustrations often don't feel as legitimate in people's eyes as a photograph would. And so we have this um, same problem of representation that we had likely white painter representing, you know, buildings that were occupied by black tenants or black workers. 
Um, and so uh, we have this problem of a white perspective on black life that's again mediating our experience of it. Um, and then also I think, um, you know, nonetheless, it's still useful to have something. Um, so to finish up, I'll be talking about um, some of the questions that have emerged from our research thus far. Um, Alfred T. Jones is a prime example of a pattern of black erasure that we see a lot of in Canadian history. He owned a business in one of London's busiest neighborhoods and his on one of the most photographed streets in London. He's listed in tax records, he's mentioned by historians, but his story in London's black history more generally hasn't really been wholeheartedly recognized as important or embraced as part of London's history. So what kind of factors enable the forgetting or the repression of Alfred T. Jones? We're certainly not the first project to try to study London's black history. And one thing I want to emphasize is that there's an ongoing discussion about London's black history. It's actually a really nice time to be working in London's history. So some of the other projects that have already kind of been successfully taking this on would be um, like uh, based in community kind of based organizations. There's museums that have kind of taken a crack at this and then also academic studies. So first, just to you know, discuss the community, we've we really owe a profound debt to black families and churches and community members who have taken great care to be custodians. They've preserved black sites like the AME Church. They've preserved records of black lives, especially when university and municipal libraries didn't. Um, and so I'm thinking particularly of the London Black History Coordinating Committee and the Beth Emanuel Church. Um, you know, I think uh, there's lots of local organizers who have helped to establish, um, for example, a plaque about uh, commemorating a school in London that had black students. Um, and we've also had a few public history projects, including the relocation of the historically black AME church from its down from its original location in downtown London to a second location uh, near the Beth Emanuel Church and then to Fanshawe Pioneer Village. So apart from saving the AME church building, which was an important site of black history, the move has also prompted new research on the church's architectural details and its religious and cultural importance to the black community in London. Um, other public history projects include the Here Here London project, which offers oral histories of the Soho neighborhood, which was the residential neighborhood of a lot of 19th century black families. And finally, we've also seen academic projects by historians such as Hilary Bates Neary, who researched the life of Lewis Champion Chambers, who is a pastor of the AME Church, as well as studies in labor studies and education. So this looks like an impressive list, but despite the depth and breadth of this list, we're finding that all too often, the community and scholarly constituencies have been working in relative isolation. There's really been kind of a siloing effect. Universities haven't historically placed enough value on black history, and the university research that was produced was often stored in academic databases and libraries, and academia has not always been an inclusive space for people of color. So this is something that our project hopes to remedy. The reason why we want to create a website is to make sure that our findings are shared in the most accessible way to the widest possible audience, and hopefully this way we can provide some redress for, the, for some of the historic practices of structural racism that universities have perpetuated. But I think we must acknowledge some of the deeper reasons why London's black history has sometimes been neglected, which is that concerns about race, class and national identity uh, raised by these black Londoners continue to disrupt understandings of Canadian heritage. This project is very much using a black geography framework. Um, so when we talk about black geography um, as an approach, uh, black geography looks at the way that race and space intersect. It centers blackness as an element of geography and tries to preserve, for instance, how early black Canadian presences are made invisible in our understanding of local or national history. So to return to Alfred T. Jones, what would happen to our understanding of London if we literally centered our understanding of London's history on the life of Alfred T. Jones? What if all of our maps were redrawn to make his apothecary shop just as visible as the Thames River or the railway tracks? Uh, the 16 black Londoners that we're studying are good examples of what the black geographer Catherine McKittrick calls black absented presences. They are simultaneously here, but not here. Black Londoners like Jones appear briefly in the literary record, but they're absent in our history books. Sometimes 
They're remembered during Black History Month, but then they're forgotten in other months of the year or relegated to a small chapter instead of being a, a quote unquote centered story. Um, so by recovering London's Black history and putting it on a map and by digitizing the textual record of London's Black community, we can make Black lives more visible, but also we can make the process of Black erasures in London more visible. We can show maps of the Black houses that were destroyed to make way for the railway tracks, Black businesses that came and went. We even have an example of Black complaints about segregation that were voiced in one 19th century newspaper, the London Prototype, but then ultimately silenced just a few days later in the London Free Press. Um, Catherine McKittrick argues that absented, pre absented presences of Black peoples in the nation assert a different, less familiar national story. Um, our preliminary research has indicated so far that one reason London's Black inhabitants have not always been memorialized may be because the lived experiences of these Black Londoners complicate or even repudiate the idea of Canada as a so-called racial haven. When Drew wrote The Refugee, he certainly wanted to present an unequivocal portrait of the success of the Underground Railroad. However, most of his London interviewees complained about the segregation of schools and churches in Canada. Another interviewee, Mrs. Henderson, uh, we don't know her, I, I don't, I'm not sure that we know her first name, I think it might be Mary, um, wasn't sure she wanted to stay in Canada, admitting, quote, um, if Washington were a free country, I would like to go back there, end quote. Such complaints about segregation in London persisted well into the 20th century. And recent books by Ron W. Shaw and Brian Martin about the migration of Confederate sympathizers, or so-called, you know, I, I use this term with caution, Confederate refugees um, who moved to London after the Civil War and became part of London's elite only confirmed suspicions that London's upper class in the 19th century frequently sanctioned or even encouraged practices of segregation and anti-Black racism. Our study of these Black Londoners will illustrate some realities that will demand some serious rethinking of Ontario's heritage, including the presence of significant racial intolerance in London, as well as the presence of forms of systemic racism in Canada. If we want to understand the lives of these Black Londoners, we need to be willing to literally make space for them in our understanding of London's history and Canada's history. This will require discussing the presence of slavery in Upper Canada prior to their arrival. It will mean performing the archival work to recover their histories. It will mean valuing the oral knowledge of families and community organizations about their family histories and their experiences of being Black in London. And it will also mean rethinking the celebration of the Underground Railroad. McKittrick points out that a celebratory understanding of the, rail, of the Underground Railroad, uh, like uh, one in which Black refugees reached Canada and led perfectly happy lives here free of prejudice, quote, allows Blackness to be comfortably placed in Canadian history, end quote. And similarly, Barrington Walker warns that the Underground Railroad myth is a story about Canadian morality that makes people feel good and it sustains Canadian nationalism. But researching and memorializing the lives of these Black Londoners beyond their brief stories in Drew's book will require us to acknowledge the complexity of the Black experience in London. Certainly some Black refugees stayed in London and made it their home and their descendants are still here and their tenacity and their resilience are very much worth celebrating. Um, but for other individuals in our study who left London in the 1860s and 70s, London was just one stop in an extremely complicated search for safety and prosperity that lasted their whole lives. So this project will analyze the structural features of early Canadian life that affected the happiness and success of Black people in London. And in this way, we hope that the Black Londoners Digital Archive offers a counter narrative to the mainstream histories attached to Canadian memory and meanings of place. We seek to center Blackness geographically and acknowledge Black Canadian presences as early and in as early and enduring rather than recent or fleeting. So um, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation to come today. Um, I wanna thank the um, librarians at Western in the um, Archives and Research, Research Center um, for the materials that we found and also Western University for financially supporting this research. And we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, this is the second time I've seen your presentation and every time I am blown away because 
I appreciate your project so much because I agree that London does not get the credit that it deserves. Um, it's not recognized as much as, say, for example, places like uh, Chatham or, um, I mean, in some instances, maybe even Amherstburg, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so I absolutely appreciate your approach and that you're trying to make this accessible to the public because, yes, sometimes it can be intimidating uh, for people um, when they see um, sometimes maybe an academic barrier. So I, I love that you're do, you're doing this project. Um, so I'm going to open it up to questions and I do have a couple of questions myself. Um, so if anyone in the audience does have any questions, if you could raise your hand or you can type the con your comment or question in the chat and I can read it out for you or call on you and you can say your question yourself. Um, but uh, for, for uh, this moment, I'm going to ask a question or two. Um, so you'd mentioned um, black families and organizations that have commemorated the significant history and their their role in um, laying a foundation as well in preserving the history. Um, I was just wondering if with the 16 families that you're working on, um, if there are any descendants uh, in the area, I mean, I, I'm sure that it's, it's probably, uh, there's probably, uh, well, I don't wanna say probably not a lot, but I was just wondering if there, um, have been any uh, descendants who have reached out, um, perhaps at other presentations that you've done, um, to share information with you? Well, I, I don't know if Miranda wants to handle that or... <laughs> um, why don't you start, and if you miss yeah. anything, or, yeah, I'll add. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, we have always been grateful for the community support that we've had so far. Um, you know, we weren't uh, sure what we were going to find when we started this. And, you know, I think that uh, we're still grateful for that. We have a few people who have come forward who are members of London's Black community who have, um, you know, sometimes they've moved on to other cities in Canada, but they know that their families were from here originally and they came to tell us about that. Um, we're in the process of getting ethics approval for um, contacting families and mm -hmm. trying to figure out what they would be comfortable sharing. You know, we want to make sure we don't cause any harm. Um, and we also want to do justice to the kind of history that we're finding um, and the records that people bring forward. You know, I, I've heard this before at a different conference, and, and it's worth repeating that a lot of the local or family records that we come across, we really owe a lot, a huge debt to Black women for preserving them. And, you know, that's true in Chatham as well, I think. But, you know, a lot of Black families had the foresight to keep records, even though they weren't being recognized as valuable by other larger institutions like municipalities. Um, and so I think we, we uh, hope that we can find to get in touch with more uh, families. We've been working with the London Black History Coordinating Committee um, to uh, get a sense of what active efforts are happening now outside of what we're doing. Um, and we've been trying to kind of, you know, uh, help them with their efforts as well. So uh, I think that those are the broad strokes of what we found so far. And I can absolutely appreciate your sensitivity because this can be a very painful history to share. Um, so, and I mean, I'll give an example. Um, for the museum, um, I research and write about a local Black family in Windsor, Essex, and publish that information on our website. And and you have to be sensitive because these are people connected to people that are still living that you're talking yeah. about. And um, I mean, my hope is with this presentation today is that um, hopefully there are family members who are listening to this presentation and seeing this presentation that will hopefully reach out because um, in the conversation that you and I had, Alyssa, before uh, we were talking about how sometimes people will reach out months and months later. I've had people reach out years later and say, oh, well, I came across this family history and I wanted to add information to it. So I'm really hoping today will be um, helpful in getting a call for family members who are connected to this. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's helpful to maybe list some of the last names of the family members that you're looking into, if you're if you're able to reveal any other family members that, that you're looking into um, for people who haven't read Drew's book. Yeah, I mean, the the Jones family, um, the Moss family, there's a Henderson family. Um, Moorhead. You know, yeah, 
um, I'm trying to think of the, of the all of the names off the top of my head. <laughs> um, we have a lot of, uh, we'll have to give you a whole list of them because I would love to meet more members of the community um, and we would absolutely welcome a conversation. It doesn't have to be on the record. <laughs> Um, but I think you're right, Lorraine, in that like every time we're approaching this, we recognize that, you know, people are coming forward with potentially, you know, information that hasn't been publicly shared before. And just like everyone's sensitive about what goes on the Internet, like, you know, posting family pictures on the Internet, um, for example, we want to be we want to make sure that everyone's on uh, comfortable with with, you know, what we're doing. Um, and so, uh, so we're proceeding, uh, with a spirit of, of great gratitude for the people who are coming forward, uh, with their own personal histories, or even just, uh, I guess, you know, uh, distant, you know, guesses about how people ended up where they are now, um, or where families moved to, um, other researchers have gotten in touch with us with research that they've collected but haven't really found a way to publish yet and they've um you know been really great um great about sharing tips about where to find things or strategies that they've used that worked in a different context um and so uh we've been we've been writing a list of acknowledgements that's going to get quite long <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Miranda did you have anything to add um I think that I would just like to add that and we touched on this in the presentation and I think that one of the reasons it's so tricky to find information about freedom seekers in Canada is that particularly after the passing of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850 in the United States, you're dealing with a population that doesn't want to be found because they're always at risk of being returned to, of being, of being found, of being sought out by, by bounty hunters, by slave catchers, as they would have been called in the 19th century, and forcibly returned to the United States. Um, so the, one of the things that we have tried to do is actually locate Drew's papers in the hopes that looking at drafts of, of his work would um, give us some insight in how he selected people, um, not only for London, but for other communities. He details um, about 12 to 15 communities in the book, and we haven't been able to locate any of his papers. So um, every time we've we've spoken publicly or we have had some um, press on the project, we have certainly gotten people to reach out and say, not necessarily to say, oh, I'm related to, for example, for example, Alfred Jones, but to say, I, you know, I know about this history. I have some family connection. None of it is specific, um, like a concrete connection, but there are people who know about these, there are people alive in 2024 who, who still know about these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to figure out how best to collect those and, and to handle them sensitively. Absolutely. And for anyone listening to today's presentation, um, following this presentation, I'm going to be posting um, the link for you to read Benjamin Drew's book. So you'll see a list of all the family names if you are connected to um, any of those family names. I'm sure that the group would love for you to reach out. Um, so if you go to our Facebook page, um, I'll be sharing the link. Um, it's just on a, a page called Documenting the American South mm -hmm. um, that leads you to it. So um, you can read the entire um, entire book um, or just London if you like, but I recommend the whole thing. But um, but yeah, so I'll be posting that afterwards as well, um, uh, just in case you're connected to any of those families. Um, I did have another question. Um, um, so in Benjamin Drew's book, and I, I say this knowing you'd mentioned bias, and I'm really glad you talked about Benjamin Drew's bias and even how a painting as opposed to a photograph can have have bias. I really appreciated that point. Um, and so I say this knowing this organization, the Colonial Church and School Society um, was, of course, it had their own bias as well. Um, but I was wondering yeah. if you looked at uh, the, the minutes or records of the Colonial Church and School Society. We haven't we yet. We haven't and yet. No. Okay. Because ahead, I, I, I apologize oh, if I'm getting your hopes up, but I do think at home I do have photocopies of 
minutes of that organization. I can check if you if you want and send the photo. It's actually years of 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 uh, records from them. And again, we, they are biased, of course. But um, but if you'd like, I can check and see if I do have them, and I can send you. Oh, that was that. Okay, great. Amazing. <laughs> okay, so, that, and that I is... apologize, I apologize if I'm getting your hopes up, but I do believe oh. that it is, I believe that it is the Colonial Church and School Society. I believe it is that organization that I have the minutes of them at home, so, or, or records of them. Reports is what it was, I think. So, well, I was and... trying frantically while you were talking to look and see if I had in my own personal, like, footnotes or anything from anything I've written down, if it was that or not, but I'll I'll check when I get home and I can... Uh, follow up with you um, tomorrow. Yeah, was that'd were be, they the organization? Yeah, yeah, that that would be amazing. Um, they were were they the organization that that created the private school? As far as yes, I believe yeah. that is the organization. Yes, yeah. yes. So um, you know, I've read about them and I haven't read their records yet. So we would love to like send us whatever. And and okay. you know, one of the things that I'm realizing is that. Even though our project is technically focused on 16 people mentioned in Drew, that was sort of the way that we limited our scope. And that was kind of a practical choice because we recognized that, you know, we were a small project starting out and we weren't really sure what we were going to find. But knowing about the experiences of other people that aren't necessarily in the purview of our project but are adjacent to it, that's still really helpful, right? Like we learn Absolutely. about what the experience of segregation was like in London. And then when we see it mentioned in other places in, in Drew or in, you know, uh, records pertaining to the 16 people that we were talking about, we have an added layer of knowledge that helps us recognize when we've found something meaningful um, that, that or maybe gives us a, a sense of what we can do with it, right? A good example is like the photographs of the courthouse. <laughs> so, yes. Poor David Mitterauer found, found these. And every time we kept getting photographs of the courthouse, we'd be like, oh man, you know, like we're not getting the building that we want. But actually not <laughs> getting the building that we want is still information that we need. Mm -hmm. Because then it shows the way that black presence was displaced out of people's minds. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And it happened at the time and it happened in throughout history since then. So then it becomes something we can talk about, even if it's not really a, we're talking about an absence rather than a presence. Um, and it, and it, that can still be productive. So if we're talking to everyone in the internet ether right now, uh, if you're connected to Black London and you think that you have something to, to contribute, we would love to hear about it. Yeah. And, and even beyond just Black London, right? I think one of the things that we've learned with this project is that the, the more that we learn about what London was like in the 19th century, the more that we can extrapolate what the experience of being Black in London was like, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I've, I, I grew up in a place and lived in a city. Um, I lived uh, in Southwest Texas before I moved here and lived in a city that had a significant uh, African American population, and so even as a white person moving to London, like London is is very lacking in diversity. I will say um, it's gotten better since two thousand eight, but in two thousand eight, it was certainly lacking in diversity. And when I have asked questions at that time, like why is it? Do you think that it's not as diverse as other Canadian cities? And the answers were just like, you know, the, those populations, those individuals just decided not to move here. And one of the things that we learned through our research that I, I and again, I had no idea, was a, was the uh, presence of, um, as Alyssa so tactfully put it, Confederate refugees. Um, I would call them, uh, use more stronger language, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> uh, but the but the idea that London had a direct London Ontario had direct connections to communities in the South, specifically to Charleston, South Carolina, where I grew up, and I had no idea until we started this project. Right? So several prominent Charleston families, um, including the Manigo family, uh, had individuals from that family settle in London after the Civil War. And so, what does that presence of these former confederates these former slate enslavers in london what does their presence um how does their presence affect 
uh, Black individuals who have come to London escaping enslavement, right? Mm -hmm. It it makes it not such a hospitable place. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, And I wanted to just, uh, I'm going to just double check to see if anyone else has any comments. So I had one more question um, and because I want to respect your time. We're hitting the hour mark here. Um, But, um, and I apologize if I am um, putting your research assistants on the spot, (laughs) but they are here today. They are prepared to, they are prepared to be put on the spot. And I just, I just thought because they're here, and I mean, you'd mentioned David with the photographs of the courthouse. I just was wondering if, if, uh, if, uh, Lizzie and Patrick and David, if you could just speak to your participation in this project, um, what things have you done um, in terms of um, uh, putting this project uh, or assisting with this project? Who's going first? <laughs> <laughs> No, Patrick. And if you're not comfortable, you don't have to. I just thought you're doing this great work too, so. That's very kind, no, yeah. Okay, well, okay, I'll go first. So uh, I think I I was actually the the last of the three of us to be brought on this project. Um, But the main thing I've been working on, well, I mean, I've been doing uh, all various sorts of of little research tidbits, kind of looking around various archival documents as as the presentation's been talking about this whole time. Most recently in the last couple of weeks, I think is maybe the most interesting thing I can talk about briefly, which is sifting uh, through a tremendous number of of, uh, London Free Press uh, articles, uh, London's uh, newspaper. And so I, I'm a historian, I, I, I have degrees in history, so that's kind of my background coming into this. A lot of uh, uh, of my work deals with, with Black history and Black Canadian history. And so newspapers are, you know, no uh, new territory for me. Uh, and as, I, as I've been looking through them, uh, specifically, this came about because Alyssa had found an article, or, or through some folks, had found an article uh, about uh, school segregation slash desegregation, or this, this, this sort of, essentially, it was sort of presented as a debate uh, in, in the London Free Press of, about uh, uh, segregation of schools on racial grounds. And basically, uh, they've asked me to kind of like look through other issues around the similar period to see if the, the debate continues. Uh, and as uh, as of now, going through a few months before that article came out to get a little bit of retrospective context, uh, there is there's no conversation about it, uh, which I think really continues this this trend we've been talking about about absence and and about um, a lack of presence uh, as being incredibly significant. That uh, I mean, at the time there were several uh, like specifically black newspapers being published uh, in in southern Ontario, southwestern Ontario. Uh, but the London Free Press obviously wasn't one of them. <laughs> and and so in this in this particular newspaper, it's pretty clear that that the uh, concerns of black folks were not constantly being addressed in this paper. Uh, and that when they were brought up, they were considered uh, to be debatable uh, in that way. And so uh, just continually looking through articles and, and issues of papers talking about the Civil War and talking about uh, uh, sort of like, you know, military strategy amid the Civil War, but rarely talking about slavery. It, it, it's really telling to see where sort of the white voices of of, Bla- of, of Londoners of the time uh, rather like where their minds are at and what they're thinking about and what they're wanting to to talk about uh, in newspapers, uh, which I think is is pretty significant to uh, the research that we're all doing. But but yeah, David or Lizzie, who's up next? Go, <laughs> oh, Lizzie. Oh sure. Um, hi. So uh, my background as well is in uh, Black history, um, more focused on Black geographies and human geography. So. I think what I bring to the research project is um, more of a conceptual lens of how to approach Black um, historical research and also looking at how to present the narratives um, and ensure that we're centering uh, Black voices rather than um, putting our lens upon the project. Um, So yeah, and I think as well as Patrick, I'm doing a lot of different tidbits of research here and there. So um, looking at newspapers, looking at obituaries, just really trying to find um, traces of Black Londoners in uh, textual evidence and as well as archival evidence. Um, And also even looking at if there's uh, family histories out there that people have maybe posted on non-academic sites. Um, I think there's a lot on the internet that we can kind of 
take advantage of and, and use. Um, I guess it's just a matter of searching for it, um, which does take quite a bit of time. Um, so yeah, and I think at the moment I am focusing on the website and um, using story maps as well to have this digital storytelling approach um, to Black Londoners and their histories. Um, and also at the moment, I am looking for uh, burial locations of Black Londoners, which has been a very tedious task mm -hmm. and it has also <laughs> been one um, that really does speak to um, absence. Um, there have been a few burial locations um, at Mount Pleasant Cemetery, which is in London, um, which have been unmarked. So there are Black Londoners actually buried there. But um, while working with the archivist at that cemetery, she has uh, told me that these burials are unmarked. So there's um, kind of just like a flat surface of ground and there's no headstone. So it's kind of an example of how these physical um, kind of remnants upon the landscape are are there, but then kind of not there. So they're, they are there, but they're kind of visible, yet invisible at the same time. So. Yeah, very interesting. I think that's all for me now. I can pass it over to David. Sure, um, I'm going to keep it short in the, in, the, in the interest of time. I've been with the project since the start, and I think I speak for Alyssa and Marinda um, that I'm really glad um, to have Patrick and Lizzie as colleagues who, with their expertise that they bring to the project, are just really important because Marinda, Alyssa, and I um, are mostly lit literature people. Um, so. We had to deal with um, a lot of different new techniques of doing research and like understanding the history of things, right? Um, and I've been doing a lot of the um, the really tedious things like going through microfilms of tax records, right? Um, which you saw how fun those are to look at um, and um, how little information you you tend to get from them. Um, so that's been um you know a lot of the kind of the the early part um that was part of this project um where we just had to like do the basics right of you know um how much of what we the information that we get from drew can we confirm um in the historical record that's just a, a huge like big um part at the beginning that we have to do and um yeah um i think the since then the work has shifted a lot towards um, understanding um, like the non-academic community better um, and to see you know who is willing to share um, their the narratives that they have or um, the histories of their families or whatnot um, that's been like some of the more more recent things i guess well i thank you for your participation in this project and for um, humoring me as I put you on the spot. So thank you so much for, um, I, I know this, that you may, may not have expected to be put on the spot like that, but I do appreciate you answering and, and talking about your participation in this project. And um, I don't see any other questions. So I did want to thank everyone and thank you so much, Alyssa and Marinda for giving this amazing presentation today. And again, to anyone who's listening, um, I will be sharing uh, the link to read Benjamin Drew's book and that will have the names of the families uh, that they're looking at that they're researching uh, so if you do have a connection to them um, you can reach out to their their project or if you uh, want to reach out to the museum i can get in touch with them as well um, and thank you again so much and i will i will as soon as i get home tonight i'm going to look and see uh, in my personal library if i do have those minutes and if i do i will be emailing you uh, I'm, I'm very excited about it i hope that i do i hope my memory Amazing. serves me well um, so if i i will reach out to you tomorrow to let you give you an update um, and i'm hoping i will have good news for you tomorrow so, um, so yes. So thank you again so much for presenting today. Uh, again, I am a huge fan of your project and I think you're doing such amazing work to uh, uplift uh, the community in London. And uh, thank you again so much for presenting today. And thank you everyone for joining us for this presentation too. Thank you for hosting us. Of course. I was very excited to do this today. So thank you. <laughs> Great.